Florence, a romantic city in the Italian region of Tuscany, was the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance, during which time individuality, science, art, philosophy, and humanism flourished. Dante, Machiavelli, and da Vinci are not the only well-known residents of this city. In the modern times, like many pulp fiction stories, the romantic city has become known for a particularly gruesome string of murders, perpetuated by a man we only know as Il Mostro di Firenze, the monster of Florence. On June 7, 1981, crime reporter for La Nazione, Mario Spezzi, got a call about a couple found dead in the hills south of Florence, near Scandici. They were discovered by off-duty police officer Vittorio Scafone. The 35-year-old reporter arrived at the scene before the police and was incredibly disturbed by what he saw. In contrast to the beautiful scenery of the summer Tuscan countryside, was a gruesome crime scene unlike anything he'd ever seen before. The male victim, Giovanni Foggi, seemed to be asleep at the wheel, but he'd actually been shot and stabbed to death. He was shot and stabbed three times. The front left window of the vehicle was shattered. The female victim, Carmela Denuccio, was found approximately 39 feet away from the car, apparently stabbed and dragged by the killer so that he could carry out his grisly mutilations. She had been shot five times, stripped naked, wearing only a necklace that was between her lips. Her vagina had been entirely removed by the killer with a notched knife, similar to that used by scuba divers. The mutilation was done with such precision that the coroner believed that the killer might have been a butcher or someone with surgical experience. Because of the sexual nature of the murders, the police assumed the killer was a male. But strangely, the killer did not sexually assault the victims and even went out of his way to not make any physical contact with them except for when he did the mutilation. The gun used was a twenty two Beretta firing Winchester twenty two long rifle H. Spezzi published an article about the crime in La Nazione, beginning a long and obsessive quest to find the killer and bring him to justice. The revelation that a psychopath was stalking the orchards of the Florentine countryside caused both sensation and fear. In a sidebar next to the article, La Nazione brought to the public's attention a similar double homicide near Borgo San Lorenzo, which was to the north of Florence. Pasquale Gentocore and Stefania Patini were teenage sweethearts who were found by farmer Pietro Landi, shot and stabbed to death in a country lane near a disco club called Teen Club on September 15, 1974. The couple had been having sex and Pasquale was on top of Stefania when they were attacked. Pasquale was shot five times. While attempting to flee, the wounded Stefania was shot three times. The killer dragged her from the car and stripped her before violating her with an olive branch. She was also stabbed on the surface of her skin over 90 times. Monetary gain was ruled out as the motive, as only a few pieces of jewelry were taken from Stefania, while the wallets of both victims remained untouched. The police did a comparison of the bullets used in both crimes, and confirmed that not only was it the same kind of ammunition, but it was fired by the same gun. The killer's gun had a defective firing pin, which left a distinct mark on the rim of the bullets. Local paramedic in Indiano, a local term for voyeurs, Enzo Spalletti was quickly arrested for the latest double homicide because his car had been seen near the crime scene, and he was reluctant to tell the police what he was doing there at night, even denying that he had been there at all. Later evidence also showed that he had told his wife about the murders before the press even began to report it. This arrest exposed a troubling subculture in the deeply religious Italian society. Since it was very common for Italians to live with their parents until marriage, they would frequently engage in sexual intercourse in their cars on lovers' lanes, and they would be followed by voyeurs, who crept in the dark, hiding among the vegetation with cameras and other electronics, to record the sexual activity of these couples. Four months later, the police discovered that they had arrested the wrong man. On October 23, 1981, the killer struck again. The victims this time were Stefano Baldi and Susana Cambi, found shot and stabbed by local farmers Bruno Corsini and Armando Cavani in the town of Calanzano, in a cattle track called Bartolini. Both victims were removed from the car. Stefano was placed in a ditch, and Susana was found hidden out of the view of the lane. Like Carmela Denuccio, her vagina was removed with a knife. A size 44 boot print from a military boot was found. If it belonged to the killer, then he was a large man. 
The morning after the murder, Susanna's mother was called by an anonymous person who wanted to talk to her about her daughter. Just days before her death, Susanna also reported that she was being stalked. According to witnesses, a lone man drove away from the scene in a red Alfa Romeo. This case is different in several ways from the previous attacks. The killer usually struck on Saturday night, while this one happened on a Thursday night. While the previous crimes happened in the summer, this one occurred in the autumn. The other attacks also took place on moonless nights, while this one didn't. It's certain that the same killer committed this murder as well, however, because the guns and bullets were the same as the previous double homicides. Enzo Spalletti was exonerated and released because of these developments. During one month, Mario Spessi published 57 articles about the case. He spent many articles discussing suspects and debunking sensational rumors and conspiracy theories surrounding the investigation and the murders. In November of 1981, Mario received a journalistic award for his articles. During an article musing on past serial killers from around the world, he gave the killer his name, Il Mostro di Firenze, the Monster of Florence. Antonia Migliorini and Paolo Mainardi were engaged to be married. They were nicknamed Venadil, which is an Italian brand of superglue, because of how attached they were to one another. They spent the last night of their life, June 19, 1982, parked by bushes in a busy area of the city of Bacciano, south of Florence. Many friends passed by their car that night and were able to clearly see their friends in the car. Antonia chose this spot out of fear of Il Mostro. Unfortunately, this public area didn't stop the monster from doing his foul deed. When the monster attacked, he shot at them from the front left window and struck Paolo in the shoulder, but fatally wounded Antonia. Paolo made a valiant attempt to escape and made it across the street, but because he was going in reverse, he unfortunately backed into a ditch. The killer then shot out both of the headlights and through the windshield shot Paolo in the head. The monster shot Paolo twice more and Antonia one more time. The killer was not able to stab the victims or perform his morbid sexual rite on Antonia due to the busy nature of the area. Soon after, some boys driving by saw the car in a ditch and thought that there was an accident. They quickly discovered that this was not the case and called the police. Paolo was still alive when he and Antonia were found, but he sadly died in the hospital. Silvia Dea Monica, a prosecutor, soon got the idea to draw the monster out. She got the newspapers to circulate a false report that Paolo managed to speak out about what happened before he died. After this latest double homicide, an envelope came into Carabinieri Station. Inside was a newspaper clipping from the summer of 1968 about the double homicide of Antonio Lobianco and Barbara Locci. It simply said, take another look at this crime. On August 21, 1968, Barbara Locci and Antonio Lobianco, two married people, were having an affair. They were parked in a wooded area near Sina, which is west of Florence. Natalino Mele, Barbara's son, was asleep in the back seat. They were ambushed while having sex by a man firing a Beretta 70 series loaded with 22 long rifle ammunition, just like the murders of Il Mostro. When Antonio, who was underneath Barbara, was shot, Barbara attempted to escape before being gunned down when she went to open the door. The killer redressed the corpses and arranged them neatly in their seats. The killer had ransacked Barbara's purse and stole a gold chain from her neck. After the murder, Natalino woke up and found his mother and her lover dead. He fled to a house nearby and knocked on the door. When the landlord answered the door, he said, Open the door and let me in. I'm sleepy and my daddy is sick in bed. Then you have to drive me home, because my mommy and uncle are dead in their car. The young boy told several different versions of his story. At first, Natalino said that a stranger carried him to the house on his shoulders while singing a popular song to comfort him. Then he claimed he had fled by himself, barefoot in the woods. Then he said that his father, or possibly an uncle, Natalino called Barbara's lover's uncles, had driven him to the house. Another version he told was that his father was there with friends, including a man named Salvatore. Then he changed his story again and said that no one was there that he recognized. The police at the time believed that this was an open and shut case, and arrested Barbara's husband, Stefano. Evidence against him was a paraffin glove test that showed he had recently used a gun, which led to him confessing to killing his wife. Afterwards, Stefano repeatedly proclaimed his innocence, and accused several of Barbara's previous lovers. 
Carmela Cutrona, as well as Salvatore and Francesco Venci. Stefano spent six years in jail, even while multiple murders were committed using the same gun as the one used to kill his wife and Antonio Lobianco. The police confirmed after receiving the envelope that the gun used in the Lochi Lobianco murders was the same one used in the recent serial murders, and that the shells even came from the same box as the ones in the other murders. Mario Spessi visited Stefano at his halfway house in Verona. He was incredibly nervous and spent most of the time in incoherent rambling, but at the end he said something interesting. They need to figure out where the pistol is. Otherwise, there will be more murders. They will continue to kill. They will continue. Mario came to believe that Stefano was present at the killing of his wife and her lover, but he wasn't alone. It must have been a delito di clan, a clan killing which included Stefano and his other Sardinian friends. According to this theory, one of the clan developed a taste for murder and continued killing using the Beretta used in the clan murder. The police caught on to this theory. This phase of the investigation was called La Pista Sarda, the Sardinian connection. Francesco, Salvatore, and Giovanni Vinci were all investigated, as they were all lovers of Barbara Locci and one or more of them was likely there when she was killed. Francesco was arrested, but while he was in jail, another murder took place. The motive for the killing of Barbara and Antonio, according to this theory, was to get vengeance on Barbara who had shamed them with her promiscuous nature and moving frequently from lover to lover. Things looked even worse for Francesco Vinci when it was discovered that after the Miglarini minority murders and the misinformation spread by Silvia Deo Monica, his car was hidden in the woods, possibly with the idea that Maynardi told the police what kind of car his attacker drove. On September 9, 1983, French tourists Wilhelm Friedrich Horstmeier and Jens Ove Rusch were in Italy celebrating a scholarship Wilhelm won. They were parked in a VW Samba bus in a meadow near Via Giogoli, in the town of Galuzzo. Jens had long blonde hair and was very small, so at a glance he could easily be mistaken as a woman. They were ambushed by the monster while listening to music and reading. The monster then moved to the other side of the van and continued his assault. When he went to stab the victims and perform his ritualistic mutilations, he discovered he'd attacked two men, tore up a nearby gay pornography magazine called Golden Boy, and scattered the pieces, and fled the scene. Some believe Wilhelm and Jens were lovers, but this has never been confirmed. Based on where the bullet struck, investigators were able to determine that the monster was 5 foot 10 inches tall. The police at first wouldn't release Francesco Vinci, believing that a relative was trying to exonerate him by committing another crime, or that he knew who did it. Antonio Vinci was then arrested on firearms charges. Later, they were forced to release Antonio, but kept Francesco in jail. Giovanni Mele, Stefano Mele's brother, and Piero Mucciarini, Stefano's brother-in-law, were also brought in for questioning, upon which time Francesco was released. On July 29, 1984, about eight months after the last attack, the monster struck again. This time the victims were Claudio Stefanacci and Pia Gila Rontini. Before her and Claudio were murdered, Pia reported that she was being harassed by an unpleasant man while working as a barmaid. There were also reports that shortly before they were murdered, they were being followed in an ice cream shop. As was their routine, Claudio and Pia parked in a wooded area in the town of Vicchio di Mugello. As with the other monster attacks, they were shot and stabbed, followed by Pia being removed from the car and her genitals being mutilated. This time the killer did something else. He removed Pia's left breast. The monster also slipped up this time, leading to a handprint on top of the car and knee marks on the side of the car. According to these knee marks, the monster of Florence was 5'9 to 6 foot tall, this murder caused the police to release the rest of the Sardinians. This killing caused public outrage due to the apparent incompetence of the police, which led to the creation of La Squadra Antimostro, a task force made specifically to investigate the murders. A bounty for information leading to the capture of the killer was also placed, for the equivalent of $290,000. This is the highest bounty in Italian history. Warning posters were also placed that warned people to stay away from the hills at night. On September 10, 1985, Silvia Dea Monica received an envelope in the mail. It was a letter, pasted together from letters from a magazine. The sender was the monster of Florence, 
confirming his identity by sending a woman severed left nipple. He said he had claimed two new victims and challenged the authorities to find them. The author was apparently uneducated, as he misspelled commonly used words. These victims had already been discovered before the letter was received. Aside from the macabre trophy, no evidence could be discovered on the letter. This attack occurred on September 7, 1985. The victims this time were French tourists, Jean-Michel Crivecvli and Nadine Mario. The couple was camping in a tent near the town of San Casciano. Because they were foreigners and on vacation, no missing persons report was filed. The monster had cut open their tent with a knife. When they investigated the noise, the killer ambushed them with gunfire, killing Nadine instantly and only wounding Jean-Michel. Jean-Michel fled the tent, knocking the killer off balance. But instead of running into the street, he ran deeper into the woods. The killer intercepted him and cut his throat, almost decapitating him. The monster returned to the tent, performing his customary mutilations and removing Nadine's left breast. Dea Monica was so disturbed by this case that she retired from law enforcement. Magistrate Mario Rotea and Pierre Luigi Vigna were the new leads on the case. These two men did not get along, which complicated the investigation. Rotea refused Vigna's request to release two of the Sardinian suspects, as he stuck to the Sardinian connection theory. Rotea focused on Salvatore Vinci, whose wife Barbina died in 1961 of asphyxiation in Sardinia. It was determined to be a suicide, but everyone in the Sardinian town believed Salvatore had killed her. Rotea, not having enough evidence to try him for being the monster, tried him for the murder of his wife. Salvatore was acquitted of the charges and walked out of court a free man. Eventually, the Sardinian connection was closed, and everyone investigated was officially absolved of any suspicion. The Carabinieri, the Italian military police, was upset by this and withdrew their involvement. Venia eventually put Commissario Ruggiero Perugini on the case. Perugini came to believe that the Sardinians had the gun but lost possession of it and that the monster committed the 1968 murder. On September 11, 1985, an anonymous letter directed the police to Pietro Pagiani, an alcoholic farmer. He was described in the letter as a dangerous, violent man who mistreats his wife and daughters. Pacciani later served four years in prison between 1987 and 1991 for abusing his wife and raping his daughters. Using a personal computer, a new tool at the time, the investigators got a list of sex offenders who were free during the murders. Pietro Pacciani was one of these men. It turns out that in 1951 he was arrested and served 13 years in prison for stabbing a man who was sleeping with his fiance. He raped his fiance right next to her lover's dead body. One detail of these crimes that stuck Perugini as odd was the fact that Pacciani told the police he had gone crazy when he saw his fiancé's left breast uncovered for her lover. The monster had removed the left breast of two of his victims. When Pacciani's house was searched, Perugini saw that Pacciani had a reproduction of Botticelli's Primavera, which depicts a pagan nymph with flowers hanging out of its mouth, similar to the gold chain hanging from Carmilla Dinuccio's lips. After searching Pacciani's house for 12 days in 1992, Perugini found an unfired 22 bullet in the garden. In court, experts said it might have been fired from the monster's Beretta. A German-manufactured notepad and soap dish allegedly belonging to the German victims was also found. Witnesses also claimed they saw a car similar to Pacciani's near the crime scenes. Pacciani himself also lived near some of the crime scenes. Pacciani was arrested and found guilty for these crimes in 1994 based on this heavily circumstantial evidence. While the public was pleased, some people were skeptical of this conviction, including Mario Spezzi and Pacciani's own wife and children. While his family hated him, they said he spent most of his time at home drunk and abusing them. In 1989, the FBI made a profile of the monster, but this was completely ignored since it contradicted the belief that Pacciani was the killer. The profile was as follows. Male, about 45 years old, comes from the area of the killings. Manual laborer, average intelligence, bachelor, lives alone or with an elderly person, lives near place of first killing, has no relations with women and likely has a sexual dysfunction, may use alcohol or drugs to pump himself up for his crimes. In 1996, 
Pacciani's conviction was overturned because of how weak the evidence was. The monster was likely impotent, but Pietro Pacciani was a womanizer. Pacciani was a thief and would do anything for money. He even stole the wallet of the man he murdered in 1951, but the monster didn't steal any valuables from his victims. He was 60 years old when the French couple was killed and had a heart condition, so it's highly unlikely he could have caught Jean-Michel, a young sprinter. He was also too short to be the 5'9 or 6-foot monster, as he was only 5'2". Pacciani even had an alibi for the Saturday before the Krivik Veli Morio murders. Many believe the couple was actually killed on Saturday rather than Sunday, since most of the monster's attacks took place on Saturday nights. It was suspected that the investigators even planted the 22 bullet, and that the prosecutors changed the date of the French tourist murders to Sunday to get Pacciani convicted. Pacciani was tried again because several witnesses agreed to testify, including a prostitute named Gabriele Girabelli, her pimp Norbuto Gali, and Pacciani's friend Giancarlo Lotti. Girabelli and Gali claimed to see Lotti's car near the 1985 crime scene. Lotti eventually confessed to being present at a few of the crimes and claimed Pacciani shot the victims, while Mario Vanni, another friend of Pietro's, did the mutilations. While initially he claimed only to be the lookout, he eventually confessed to shooting the German victims. The desperate police formed the theory that Pietro Pacciani was the leader of a satanic cult, including Mario Vanni and Giancarlo Lotti, and that the murders were satanic rituals. Due to Lotti's accusations, Mario Vanni was arrested as well, while Pacciani was held for retrial. Pacciani died of cardiac arrest in 1998 before the trial. Mario Vanni and Giancarlo Lotti were convicted. Lotti died in prison in 2002. Despite these convictions, most still consider the case to be open. Giancarlo Lotti was not viewed as a reliable witness, as he was an alcoholic living in a halfway house. Many believe he made these confessions to improve his living conditions. Apparently the police doesn't believe him either, as they continue making arrests and outlandish theories. In 2000, American crime author Douglas Preston moved to Florence with his family and became close friends with Mario Spezzi. They began researching and investigating the crimes together. During their sleuthing, they made an important discovery when they were shown crime scene photos of the 1985 crime scene by entomologist Francesco Entrona that were taken on the Monday after the murders. The photos show maggots on Nadine's body, indicating that she had been killed no less than 36 hours before the photo was taken. This discredits the police claim that the attacks occurred on September 8th, proving that Pacciani did not commit the murders. Michel Giutari, a prosecutor, completely dismissed this development. In 2004, a pharmacist named Francesco Calamandre was accused of leading the cult, supposed to have committed the murders, and of killing a gastroenterologist named Francesco Narducci, whose corpse had been found floating in Lake Trasimeno 20 years previous. His death was ruled a suicide during the initial investigation, as he had drug and depression issues but the police decided he was killed by Calamandre in his monster cult. Calamandre had been accused in 1988 by his ex-wife Mariala Ciula. She claimed that when they were still married, she found a 22 Beretta and some of the remains of the female victims in his refrigerator. Upon searching the house, nothing was found. In 1991, she claimed that during the 1968 murder, they'd heard gunfire and carried a baby to safety and had seen ugly people including Pacciani, Vanni, and Lotti, and that on the night of the last murder, Francesco had came back home with bruises all over his face. His home was searched again, but nothing was found. In 2000, Mariella was placed into psychiatric care. Mario Spessi, who is a friend of Calamandre, was investigated as well for this alleged murder. Mario had been highly critical of the investigators, so many viewed this as an attempt by the prosecutors Giuliano Minini and Michel Giutari to silence him. Douglas Preston, who had moved back to America but returned to Italy on vacation, was also brought in for questioning by Minini, and was accused of planting evidence in the home of a man Preston and Spezzi had investigated as being the monster. The investigation on Preston was suspended so he could go back to America, which he did the next day. Douglas Preston has not been back to Italy since he left that day in 2005. Mario Spessi was arrested in 2006, then released and cleared of all suspicion due to the public outrage. In 2007, Calamandre was tried and acquitted of the charges, 
but sadly died in a nursing home in 2009. Douglas Preston and Mario Spezzi's true crime novel The Monster of Florence was published in 2008. Fortunately, the corruption of Menini and Giutari caught up with them. They were tried and convicted in 2010 for abuse of power. Sadly, Mario Spezzi, who had done so much to get to the truth about this disturbing case, passed away on September 9, 2016, after a long illness. The Monster of Florence has not committed any confirmed murder since 1985, but he has still not been brought to justice after his 17-year reign of terror.